So my name is Kimberly Jackson and welcome to this, the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions. Um, we have a bit of a rough start today because we have an icon with us who is on the road doing the good work that we need to have done in our community. So if you hear some background noise or if you hear some audio issues, we ask you to be patient with us as we're very grateful for his time and presence. With that being said, I'm going to quickly go through my welcome so that we can have a meaningful, engaging conversation today. As I noted, my name is Kimberly Jackson. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions at St. Petersburg College. The think tank was created by Congressman Bill Young as a way to have nonpartisan conversations, solution-oriented on economic, social, and mission-oriented programs. Today, I'm so pleased that we have sponsors from literally the entire legal community in the Falls area. Before I introduce them, I want to briefly go through Ben Crump's resume, which of course he does not, uh, we don't need to go through it in, in depth, but um, I want to thank you, sir, for all that you've done. And I do want to read briefly about some of your accomplishments. You were steadfast dedication to justice and now civil rights and personal injury attorney Benjamin Crump has established himself one of the nation's foremost lawyers and advocates for social justice. He is truly an icon when it comes to helping those less fortunate and marginalized and those who need our best efforts, particularly as attorneys. Crump's tireless advocacy has legislation and development, developing implicit bias training and policies. Of course, he has represented many um, people who needed our support Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, and most re recently George Floyd. And he's recently wrote a book called Open Season, and I don't know if you had an opportunity to read it, but it is truly a review of what we have done as a community and what we need to do more as a country. With that being said, I'd like to introduce Benjamin Crump. I'd like, next like to introduce one of our own personal um, advocates in the community, and that's Sarah Mallow. Sarah Mallow is the public defender elect for the Sixth Judicial Circuit. She serves Pinellas and Pasco counties. She has practiced criminal law for over 20 years. She has experience as a family law attorney, civil litigator, professor, presenter, trainer, manager, board member, and government liaison. And she also believes that being a member of a vulnerable population doesn't define you. And again, I wanna thank Sarah for taking the time to not only embark on this journey, but to have meaningful conversations as we prepared for this. Finally, I would like to thank the entire legal community um, that is sitting, as you see our backgrounds, our backgrounds are to showcase the many um, attorneys in town who have worked with us. I'm going to give them more time at the end of the program, but if you would, um, Kyle, who's our tech person, show all the many faces, who have been in the background from Stetson University College of Law, our dean, um, Sarah's team, the two assistant um, public defenders, um, the Fred G. Menis Bar Association, who inspired us to do this work in the first place, the George Edgecombe Bar Association, the Barney Masterson's Inns of Court. And in addition to that, we have the Latin Bar Association, and we have also the Criminal Bar Association, I'd like to show all their faces briefly before we begin. Mr. Crump, we had had this very well, uh, of course, orchestrated program, but now that you're on and we see you're in a car, I wanna make sure that you speak first before people, so people can hear you and have the questions answered. Kyle, will you show all of the panelists and panelists, will you please um, take, your, uh, show, take your video, place your video on? Well, thank you. I want to give a, a full thank you at the end of the program. Mr. Crump, the program is situated for you to speak first and then Ms. Uh, Malo to speak, followed by uh, a lot of questions um, from the community. Um, the questions will be live for the most part. If there are questions that are particular to an individual entity in the community, then the panelists are here to answer the questions directly. We are going to try to get to all the questions. Of course, we cannot determine if we'll make them all. We would encourage our uh, participants and panelists um, to please put all of your questions in the Q&A so that we can reach them and review them as we're having the conversation. And with that, Mr. Crump, I'm gonna let you go. Please speak. Thank you.
Thank you, thank you, Tenzin. Solutions. Now more than ever, we need to implement systematic reform and policies to change the culture and behavior of policing in America. And I profusely apologize for being in an automobile. That was not my ske uh, intended schedule today, but I uh, regrettably inform you all that I am en route to Milwaukee, Wisconsin to represent the family of Joe Acevedo, who was a 25-year-old Puerto Rican uh, citizen who tragically was killed at the hands of a police officer. We have all seen the video of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where the police kept their knee on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Well, based on the 911 tape and the police body cam video, the family of Joe Acevedo has reason to believe that the police choked him for almost 10 minutes. That's longer than the encounter with George Floyd. And so it is those reasons that I am uh, coming to you in not the manner that we had intended. I know Mr. Hinton Bowder had worked with the Institute for weeks to make sure that we had everything scheduled. But unfortunately, because Black Lives Matter, when we get the call, we have to answer the bell. Because if we don't answer the bell, who will answer the bell for marginalized, disenfranchised, and dehumanized uh, communities within our society? Um, I think about Kimberly, the reason we need solutions is because of Brianna Taylor, who I represent, who was in her apartment in the sanctity of her own home, sleeping in her bed at 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning, her and her boyfriend, Kenny Walker. And you can just try to imagine your daughter sleeping in her bed, thinking that she's completely safe. That's where we want our young people to be at. And then the police, unbeknownst to them, execute a dangerous, no-knock warrant, I believe unconstitutional, that violates the Fourth Amendment right against illegal especially in your home, your most sacred place in the world. Well, they use a battering ram. They bust open her door, front door, and they come in. Kenny Walker and Breonna Taylor believe they are being burglarized. They believe this is a home invasion. The police don't announce themselves, number one. Number two, they are in plain clothes. And number three, they never identify themselves as police officers. Uh, and they literally come into the house. Kenny Walker, who's doing what I think every uh, man should do, who's trying to be a protector, he tries to uh, protect his castle. He tries to protect his woman. He tries to protect their lives. He's a, a registered gun owner. He has no criminal history, nor do Breonna Taylor. They've never been arrested in their lives. He works at the post office. She, as many of you may know, works as an EMT on the front line battling uh, the coronavirus pandemic, trying to save lives. In fact, her mother's main concern, Kimberly, was that I pray that while she's at the hospital, she doesn't contract the coronavirus and end up dying from that. Never, ever fathom how her daughter actually was taken from her. And so Kenny Walker, with his registered gun on her, is thinking he's confronting uh, burglars because the police never identified themselves. He shoots a warning shot. And then the police just unload. They shoot about 25 to 30 rounds. They shoot from the front door. They shoot from the side window. They shoot from the patio. I mean, they're shooting blindly into the apartment. They're so 
reckless in their shooting that a bullet goes into the neighboring apartment bedroom where a five-year-old little white boy is sleeping in the bed and his parents even talk about nobody identified themselves and nobody uh, uh, yelled that it was the police. And therefore, Kimberly, and tragically, the result is Brianna was mutilated while she was practically naked uh, with eight bullets. And her mother, Tamika Palmer, and her little sister, 20-year-old Janaya, for two months, every day called to the sister department uh, daughter. So we may be having some technical difficulties with Mr. Crump as he travels. I would ask again that we have some patience. If it goes on for too long, of course, we will National talk. National Bar Association lawyer uh, called me with the family saying, we got to do something about this because Brianna Taylor likes matters. And, you know, to add insult to injury, as we started to investigate and dig for answers, we found out that the police officers uh, presented false information at best or outright lied at worst to get this <laughs> excuse me, to get the search warrant uh, executed, signed off by the judge. And so that came out. The fact that they violated all kinds of policies and procedures were revealed. The fact that the police officer who was finally terminated on Friday left the scene for almost two hours and was not accounted for violating all policies and procedures and who in fact fired 22 rounds out of the 30 rounds. And so it's all this digging that we've been doing to get that information. And still, a hundred days later, nobody, none of those police officers have been arrested and charged for executing this completely innocent black woman. And every time I was doing the Mod Aubrey interviews, I would go and say, we have to recognize our black sisters who are being killed by police, just like we recognize our brothers, who we all know the hashtags, whether it's Trayvon, whether it's Michael Brown, whether it's Alton Sterling, whether it's Botham John, whether it's Tamir Rice, whether it's Walter uh, Scott, whether it's Laquan McDonald, whether it's Orlando Castile, whether it's Stephon Clark, whether it's Eric Gardner, and you know, whether it's Terrence Crutcher, the list goes on and on and on. And we have to give the same recognition and respect to black women who are being killed by police like uh, Pamela Turner and Breonna Taylor. But to try to bring this home, there's a reason we have to have policies and procedures because we cannot have two justice systems in America, one for black America and one for white America. We have to have equal justice for the United States of America. And the fact that I'm involved in the Maude Aubrey case and I'm uh, representing on Breonna Taylor case, I have a unique vantage point. And never have I seen self-defense so vividly distinguished in black and white as these two cases. The fact that when Ahmaud Aubrey, who I believe and his family believe was lynched for jogging while black in broad daylight on video in 2020, in broad daylight and on video, and when the police came to confront the murderous duo, this father and son who killed this young black man who was just jogging and we see the whole episode play out on video they said it was self-defense and the police accepted their word and they got to go home and sleep in their bed at nights peacefully for over 10 weeks not until the video was shown to us that they finally were arrested it wasn't when the police saw the video, it was when we the people saw the video that they were finally arrested. 
the police, I believe, never intended on arresting them. They were well, uh, I guess, content with sweeping Ahmaud Arbery's life under the rug. But then, when you just oppose what happened with Ahmaud Arbery's case, with Breonna Taylor's case, after Breonna's dead on the uh, floor in the hallway, and you hear that hor horrifying 911 call from Kenny Walker. And it's hard, but I think you all should listen to it and Google it. Uh, when he's saying, please stay with me, Bray, please, please stay with me. He's crying and begging for help with 911, which tells you their mentality that if they thought it was the police, he would have been asking them for help. But he called 911 and was saying that uh, somebody broke in our house and they shot my girlfriend. And he's pleading out his heart. And when the police come and confront him in the apartment, he says, it was self-defense. We thought you all were burglars. We thought you all were committing a home invasion. Well, the police does not um, uh, accept his word. They arrest him. They take him to jail. And they charge him with attempted murder where he's facing life in prison if he is convicted. We got the charges temporarily dropped, but the district attorney has told us in no uncertain terms they're still investigating this matter, and they may reintroduce the charges against Kenny Walker. And so that is self-defense in black and white, and it underscores this fact that we do seem to have these two justice systems in America. And so we need systematic reform. When I was testifying with uh, Philonis Floyd, the brother of George Floyd last week at the United States uh, Congress, the Judicial House Committee, uh, Senator, I'm sorry, Representative Sheila Jackson Lee asked me, Attorney Crump, why do you think this is a crisis that warrants immediate congressional attention. And I told her if we didn't do something immediately to change the culture and the behavior of policing in America, that I predict in 30 days, there will be another black person killed in America unjustifiably, unnecessarily, and senselessly at the hands of the police if we don't do something. And unfortunately, I was right. And it did not take 30 days. That was on Wednesday. And then two days later in Atlanta, Georgia, Rashad Brooks was killed on Friday night. And that's why we have to do something immediately to get new policy. And that's why I'm so proud to work with this great think tank the Institute for Strategic Policies and Solutions. We desperately need you all, and thank you for inviting me on to this conversation. Well, Mr. Crump, I, I wanted to say um, briefly, although I, I can hear you, um, and thank you so much for your words. You are frozen. I've been Kimberly? texting, yes, I've been texting um, Mr. Uh, Hinton, um, Mr. Battle. So can you all still hear us? So while you fix your audio and your visual, we're going to transition. Um, first of all, again, I wanna say thank you. Um, please don't go anywhere. I will um, come back to you as soon hey, as Kimberly? you visual together. Yes? So we're going to mute you for right now until we fix it. And then we're going to transition to Sarah Malo, who is going to jump in. And uh, so Sarah, we practiced for this. We had no idea where in the world Mr. Crump would be. Um, he talked about some significant and serious cases. I really wanted him to expand on now that he's been around the country with so many attorneys and testifying and, um, and we see some reforms happening when this process was. We're on that. So Sarah, if you can jump in while they fix their screen and audio, I would certainly help and be, of course, flexible when he's able to jump back in. Of course. Uh, and thank you. Good Hello. afternoon, everybody. I'm just so pleased for everybody to be uh, here. First of all, I'd like to thank 
uh, the St. Pete College and the president, Dr. Williams, for uh, having the foresight to hire executive directors like Kimberly Jackson. Uh, we, she's done an amazing job at making me feel comfortable, getting everybody prepared and ready for this. It's no small task to uh, get attorney Benjamin Crump on the line and to host a forum like this. So I just would like to recognize her hard efforts for that, her preparedness, her initiative, and also for her work on the board of the St. Pete or St. Petersburg Flea uh, Clinic. I just found out recently that she's on that board there. And so that's some really great work. Um, I also want to congratulate Daniela uh, Weaver Rogers. She is the new president for Menace, and I know she's going to do a fabulous job. And thanks, Shaquana Harper for her reign as president. Uh, she did an amazing job. She used to be PD6, so PD for life. Uh, these women and the members of Menace are really coming to uh, into the theme of call to action and committed to serve. They're doing an amazing job. Um, our community, and I think it's unique, and I think Mr. Crump could testify to this, that we are pretty unique here in the Sixth Judicial Circuit and that we have such a strong community. If you look at the members that are on this, it's basically the entire legal, com uh, legal community. And so I think that's important to recognize that there's strength in the Sixth Judicial Circuit. Uh, and then there's Attorney Crump. So Attorney Crump, listen, uh, we as public defenders know the weight of carrying your clients' traumas. And we acknowledge the strength in you taking the pain of more than 200 police violent cases and turning that pain into something, into justice, right? Justice for all. And so we acknowledge what that takes from a person and what it means to carry those people with you. You know, it's impressive that you can go through that list of names and I know why you can. Because when you live with those families, when you hold their hands, as we do as public defenders, it, it means something to you. It's part of you. You carry them with you wherever you go. And so I just would like to recognize that uh, and appreciate what you're doing with that. Uh, it's important. And Thank we you, know Sarah. what it takes. Thank you. Uh, There's a place in heaven for public defenders. <laughs> Well, I don't know if it's heaven, but uh, it's going to be fun wherever it is we go. <laughs> so at any rate, uh, so a lot of you on the call may be wondering, like, who is this girl? How did she get on the call with Attorney Crump, right? I wondered that myself a little bit, <laughs> to tell you the truth. But I know what it is. You know, I work with some amazing people, and that's really what called me to be a public defender, right? Uh, and so I have to give a shout out to... Uh, Howard Williams and for Catherine Henry. Uh, these people are just amazing. All of the people in our office are amazing. It's like any other organization. Some shine a little brighter than others, but uh, you know, and as a whole, these are people that are doing uh, work and really not getting paid for that. So my goal as the public defender and my goal in criminal justice reform, or really I like need to get this book for attorney crump this open season because it's transformation it's criminal transformation that we need to be talking about it needs to be justice for all so how do we do that right so there's so many things to talk about and so i have to be really mindful of my time here because once i get to talking it's hard to get me to stop um there's so many Sarah, pieces I'm that are broken. For one second too i want to make sure for timing wise Mr. Crump, are you still at a stable space? Were you um, done with your comment so that we can let Sarah speak and go back to you? Certainly, I, I'm done with my comments. And I, unfortunately, I'm traveling, so I pray that I don't have any interruption, Kimberly. Okay, so before then we go with Sarah, I did want to make sure before we were cut off again, you had mentioned, and I think it was really important, and Sarah, thank you for acknowledging that, that you have now gone around the country several times over, but this time it does feel different. You have met with significant attorneys and you've also testified. Do you feel like the testimony changed in terms of the topic, here's criminal justice reform? And I do wanna be mindful that we have um, many attorneys online who love to hear your comments on that before we go back to Sarah and thank you. Certainly Kimberly and again, thank you, Sarah. Um, I believe this tragic killing of George Floyd because it was so riveting. We saw the documentary of a person 
being murdered by the police. But it just was an entry that we see him narrate the, his own documentary of his death. He said that I couldn't breathe 16 times. He said, I, I can't feel my insides. I can't feel my stomach. I can't feel my legs. You know, he said, I'm through now. Uh, and then at the end, he called for his mama, uh, even though she had been dead for two years. And it was just riveting that you watched this happen. This video has been viewed now over 175 million times uh, across the America alone. Uh, I'm sure probably double that amount if you consider the rest of the world who's all been watching. And I think this represents, because we cannot unsee that video, Kimberly, it represents the best opportunity I have seen since I've been an attorney for having systematic reform in policing in America. I mean, as many people who are marching are white people and Asian people and black people and Hispanic people, it's everybody's marching saying we can't breathe. And so I do believe that this is the time, and, and I want to say this on the record because I know there may be some reporters there. I, I, people say that the protesters are the reason why the cities across America are burning. I object. It's not the protesters who started these fires to burn it. It is police brutality and a racist criminal justice system that started these fires to burn. And, and the only way these fires will be extinguished, Kimberly, will be with police accountability and equal justice. We've been um, researching as a group the uh, judicial acts and policing in America and a uh, a lot of other research links I've given them. I've actually given them way too homework. So Sarah, now that you have the opportunity to hear Mr. Crump's um, position on these issues, could you please speak about specifically Pinellas County and what we're doing in the Sixth Judicial Circuit? And thank you for your patience as we had to toggle between the two of you. Yeah, no, of course. So, I mean, I think that there's a couple of things that have to happen, right? So this is a strategic solution. So how do we be strategic about what we're doing here? I mean, you know, uh, Attorney Crump's been on a lot of news things. He's been in a lot of Washington Post, New York Times. And so one of the things that he said that really resonated with me is that, you know, if we don't act now, we are going to squander this time, right? So it's time to do something. I think back on legislative sessions, like even last legislative sessions, we got into criminal justice reform. But again, we fall short, right? And so how do we do that? And I think the way you do that is I think you have to legislate, you have to regulate, and then you have to compensate, right? So the first part of it is legislate, right? We need angels of justice to go to Tallahassee, right? We need angels of justice to go to Tallahassee and do the legislative part of it, right? So it's one thing to talk about it, and it's another thing to move that ball down the field. So how do we do that? You start with legislation, right? That's where it has to happen. So everyone on this call should know who their congressmen are, who is your House representative. And Pinellas County is particularly poised this session, right? The Speaker of the House is Chris Sprouse. Where is he from? Pinellas County. The Speaker of the Senate is Wilton Simpson. Where is he from? Pasco County, right? So now we have the Speaker of the House and the Speaker of the County from the Sixth Judicial Circuit. If we wow. can't move the ball here, we're not going to move it. Right? So what we've done internally in the public defender's office and probably how Catherine, Catherine and Howard were involved in these things externally anyway, but within the office, what we did is we came up with PD6, right? So there's so many things that have to be fixed. You have to narrow it down, right? You can't just do broad requests, right? We want the death penalty gone. Do we think we can make that happen in the next session? Probably not. But what can we make happen, right? So I think you have to start defining it in those terms. I think that you have yep. to figure out and start having relationships, and that means every organization, right, with your representatives. Talk to Ben Diamond. Talk to Jennifer Webb. 
talk to Brandis, talk to Rusan, talk to Hooper, go and meet these people. When you sit down and have a cup of coffee with somebody, it is, you get to know them, right? This is kind of the problem in this COVID period where you're doing it virtually. When you sit down and meet with somebody in person, you get to know them and they get to know you and then kind of happen, right? And so that's, so that's, that's relationships and that's how you do legislation. And Sarah, I just wanted to say that's so critical that you have interaction with your elected representatives. We're the lawyers, for God's sake. We uh, need to be the voice on legal issues for our community. And that's why I'm proud that my law partner, Michelle Rayner, is uh, endeavoring to be part of the Florida legislature because we need voices out there of people who have been in courtrooms who have fought for the marginalized people. Uh, Daryl Rushan is a lawyer. We just need to use our influence to fight not only in the courtroom, but also outside the courtroom in the state house. We have the power. We just got to have the courage to do it. I mean, that we just got to have the conviction to do it. We can make a change. I believe that so much right now in America. All over Florida, they've been marching, saying we can't breathe. If we can't make the people in Tallahassee hear our voices now, then we would never be able to make them hear it. So we got to, like Sarah said, organize, strategize. I mean, it's that critical, y'all. And that's why the Institute for, uh, uh, you know, social, I'm sorry, strategic policy and solutions is so vital right now because we need a think tank to tell our people what are we fighting for. Right. So it's like you said in your book, right? If you all have not read the book, read the book, buy the book, give the book to your friends, and he doesn't need my accolades on it. But one of the things in the book that he recognizes, Attorney Crump recognizes, is that legislation is like chess, right? The moves are not clear. And yep. so it's strategic. And so every person, every organization, that means St. Pete Bar, Clearwater Bar, should take a picture of your icon and Mr. Crump, right? Take a screenshot and go pass that to your legislatures and say, you better listen to us. Because guess what? Kimberly Jackson has Hinton's number and you don't want me to call attorney Crump and ask him what he thinks about this, do you? And so that's the way you move things. But you don't have to be, uh, you know, they don't have to do ultimatums, form relationships and get people yes, to hear you. There are good people in the legislature, right? There are. And so they just have to, you have to ask those specific asks, broad ask, don't make legislation. Specific ask, make legislation, right? So draft it for them. There are other samples out there of what we can do. So the Public Defender's Office has, and if anybody wants to join us, I think partnership is key, right? So the more they hear it from the more organizations, the more powerful it becomes. So we broke it down into six, the PD6. We got death penalty, and we I got to give out a shout out to some people there. We got Allison Miller heading that up, right? We've got juvenile. So we've got David Moran and Ari Weisberg doing that. We've got mental health, which is, you know, if anybody knows me, it's mental health is my thing, right? So then we also have uh, criminal justice reform, which Howard, Catherine, Laura Johnson have been uh, working on real hard. We've got COVID-19, and I'm going to leave somebody out in this for sure. And then we just have somebody to advocate for public defenders, because one of the things we are on the front line, right? How many of those affidavits do we read? We, read, we represent most of the population. We are at every first appearance. We get those affidavits on the protest and whatnot first, right? So we see that. We just got notified, we got a 6% cut. So when we're talking to our legislatures, the PD's office just got cut 6%. How, how do I make that work, right? So the people that are advocating and that are looking at the SOPs and are looking at the IAs, uh, we just got a 6% cut. So we have to manage that somehow. So this COVID-19 is gonna really affect the economy. Initially, I was gonna go up there and ask for lots of funding for things, but uh, at this point, you know, uh, we're hurting. So help us. So Sarah, there are a lot of questions starting to come through. Um, I'm 
for the good of those of us on the call that are not attorneys, I'm going to <laughs> explain um, acronyms when we use them, like yes. <laughs> so that our, our larger community um, involved. Because the point of this conversation, too, is for our non lawyers on this call, is to make sure that you know, at least in the sixth circuit, that Pinellas County is working, that we are having meaningful conversations, that we have strong bar associations to work with each other. And that we want to implement the changes that are actually being recommended by those around the front line, like Mr. Crump and many other attorneys who are doing this work. I'm going to start opening it up for questions because, again, I, I want to be mindful of as many as possible. Um, Sarah, the first question, and this is for you, Mr. Crump, too. Um, you mentioned to remind us all that being a member of a vulnerable population doesn't define you. I applaud you on this assertion you be able to elaborate on this thought. And then after that, Mr. Crump, if you would share your thoughts too, could you say things similarly than that. In your book, it really resonated me that there is a section where you talk about the importance of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment as a, a, a straight uh, lover of history. I think it's important for us to really discuss what a vulnerable population is and our duties as attorneys to not have that be defined in the community. Before. Sarah. Can, can, you ask, can you ask me the first part of that question? Yes, the first part of the question was based on a, um, what uh, what Sarah said to uh, during her speech, which was you that being a member of a vulnerable population doesn't define you. I applaud you for this assertion, and would you elaborate on that thought? So that's yeah, the so one of the things in my uh, experience in the mental health uh, realm of the criminal justice system okay. uh, was that the way we talk in vernacular becomes very important. And so I probably have taken that from NAMI, to be honest. And NAMI is a really great organization that's a major advocate. And if you want to know how to advocate for something, look at their website. They really have got it figured out. They have links. And they also uh, you know, have a lot of great strategies on how you legislate things. But being part of that vulnerable, so what we would say in court, right, is he he is bipolar, right, or he is schizophrenic, and so that really, when you start to think about how you speak about things or how you talk about things, and I think that that's changing the narrative, and I think Attorney Crump talks a lot about that, so I'd like for him to talk a little bit more about that, but so one of the things that I came across was, you know, why would I say that about my client? They aren't schizophrenia, right? They're a person that suffers from schizophrenia as a mental health condition, right? And so, and then when we talk about like our managing entity is called Central Florida Behavioral Health Network, right? So behavioral health indicates that it is a choice, that it is a behavior. And so I think you have to be very cautious. And I think that that goes across all different types of vulnerable populations, right? The vernacular is changed, the narrative is changed, and that keeps that population where, you know, it's vulnerable. And so I think you have to really address that. And so when I say that in my speeches, what I'm talking about is whatever you have, being a black person, being mentally ill, that doesn't define you, right? What defines you at the end of the day is how you treat other people, right? And who you are as a person. And so I think what we have to do is make sure that we don't let the narrative define us, particularly with the mentally ill has been my experience, so. Mr. Crump, if you will elaborate, I did try to text Cliff because um, I know we're having some audio challenges, but again, the premise was the, of the question is, how okay. do we move forward and not let this define us and then I'll move on to the next question, thank you. Okay, let me, uh, and I think you said something about the 13th, 14th, uh, 12, 13, and 14th and 15th amendments, I, I will quickly say a word about them and try to get in as many questions as I can because I know I'm going to have to leave in a, a few minutes. Um, obviously, we know the 13th amendment uh, freed the slaves uh, except, the big except, uh, as punitive measures for uh, crime. And we know whether well, it's uh, from Ava DuVernay's 13th or Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, that they have really tried to just make uh, our skin color be uh, 
terminable or associated with that of criminal suspicion, if not criminality in and of itself. And so we know that time the 13th Amendment passed, literally they started putting black people back on these uh, slave plantations as in literally for uh, slave work uh, in the prisons, I'm sorry, prison work release programs. And what they said, Kimberly and Sarah was, the Virginia Supreme Court literally said it, when the blacks challenged them being arrested for vagrancy laws, that if they were walking down the street and they didn't have a job after they were emancipated in 1865, they were then immediately arrested and put right back in prison and then put right back on the same plantation that they had just allegedly been freed from. And the state of Virginia Supreme Court ruled that when you're in prison, you are a slave of the state. So you just went from being a slave of a different master, where it wasn't a private uh, person anymore. Now you were a slave of the state. And that's what we still see today. In fact, that decision was affirmed by the United States Supreme Court. And it is still never been overturned. They see when you're in prison, you are literally the slave of the state. The 14th Amendment that posed to give us due process, uh, we know as soon as that passed down in Louisiana in the Crook uh, Shank case where the black people went and said that we're going to vote and the white people had the massacre, they end up charging a white man. He got convicted and then the uh, by the federal government and then the United States Congress said the federal government did not have a right to do a, a, a take over a case and usurp the authority of the state. The state had the right to prosecute the white man for killing the black people, but the federal government didn't. And that was upheld by the United States Supreme Court in the immediate aftermath of the 14th Amendment within 10 years. Every uh, so-called Civil Rights Act they passed, the 13th, 14th, and the 15th Amendment, the United States Supreme Court did came and took it away from the people, whatever rights have been restored on us. And we saw that in the 15th Amendment with the right to vote in Alabama, where they started upholding all the poll tax and everything, the grandfather clause and so forth. The United States Supreme Court said that was completely uh, legitimate and justify them usurping that authority. So what we have still in America today is the intellectual justification of discrimination. They come up with technical reasons. I don't care what it is, any situation you got, Sarah, and Michelle, Rain and I talk about this all the time. No matter what the situation is, hope people are going to get the most of injustice, least of justice. And so that is our fight. And so I'll shut up there so we may get one or two more questions. And so if we lose Mr. Crump again, I just want to let you and remind you that we have the team of all the sponsors in the back, which I will acknowledge before we leave and give Danielle in particular time to talk. They can answer questions in real time. So some of you all might get answered responses, written responses. The next question is, how do we access data on the local level and the criminal system that is um, disaggregated by race? And is there a, a way or a systematic way to do better collection of data for the use of attorneys and police officers? Sarah, can you answer that? I can't, well, yes. I would like to thank Attorney Crump for his last comments though, because uh, being poor is a great equalizer. And I had had that conversation with a couple people up in Tallahassee, right? So. Uh, it doesn't discriminate. If you're poor, you're poor. And so if you look at a lot of the laws, right, and so one of the things that we had tried to get past was the grand theft and the minimum, you know, what, how much, like, if you steal my cell phone, that's a felony, right? And so why is that? And so that's the chess game, right? And so that's, I think, what has to be happening in racial 
uh, equality. And I think when you do legislation, there should be a racial equality impact statement with that, right? There's an economic state statement that comes with those things. And so I think that, you know, you have to reveal that. But as to your question on the data, right? So there's a lot of question about the data. So I'm from Missouri originally. And so there's a saying about statistics, right? There's lies, damn lies, and statistics right? So statistics can be skewed to say whatever you want them to say, right? And so I don't like statistics. I took statistics when I worked on my MBA when I was in San Francisco. Uh, and what I found out was that, you know, it, I need to be a lawyer because uh, statistics are unreliable. It's the data that you put into those statistics. But should data be available? Absolutely. So who gets that right? The federal system has it right. If you go on to the federal system, there are statistics and data, right? And so when we fill out a score sheet or the state attorney fills out a score sheet or there's a sentencing, all of that data is put in electronically, right? And so there's been some conversation about it being on the public defender who's just got a 6% cut across the board of why you know we don't have that data. And so my question then is, why is it on the public defender? Shouldn't everybody want that information? Shouldn't the judges want that, right? So who's in charge of regulating once we legislate, right? You legislate, you regulate, and then you compensate. So the regulation part of it is the data part of it, right? So who has an interest in that? The public defenders have an interest. Private attorneys have an interest in that. Uh, the judiciary should have an interest in that, right? And so when you're talking about judges, they should have an interest in the data too, right? And so there's specific budgets for that. And so to have it come out of my budget or the public defender's budget, you know, that's a little cumbersome. I think it should be for everybody and I think it should be readily accessible. Our sheriff actually does a pretty good job if you go on to his website on IA reports. And that was one of the things that we talked about when we were you know, strategizing internally with the public defender's office is making sure that we had current SOPs. There's 28 different policing agencies. That's a lot of agencies and a lot of SOPs to keep current, right? But I do think it's important that we know who the officers are, what their names are, what their reports are, what they look like, what they've been charged with, whether they've had substantiated reports. And the sheriff's office does make that readily accessible on his website. So data is important, but I caution everyone to look at statistics, right? Because you just have to look at how that data is being manipulated. It's just like a witness on the stand. You gotta test the credibility of that, right? I have one question as I see Mr. Crump looks like he's about to um, take off. And so, and first of all, thank you, Sarah. That's an important question that is asked often of us. Where's the data? How can we get it? Um, we will mention at the end that all the links that I've provided to our panel for research will also be provided on our website um, in about a week with all the information that we used as data points. I will ask the, answer the policy question too that was asked in the chat. But Mr. Crump, before you go, and again, thank you so much for your time. In a time period where you know uh, you are needed literally everywhere um, as a voice um, for those who don't have voices, I appreciate it. The important to me for lawyers having this conversation is that we do not have to agree. We just have to address the issues. And as long as we put forth recommendations that address issues from all aspects and all ideologies and all perspectives, but in accordance with our laws, that, that's the best that we can do as attorneys. So this question is, with so much focus centered on the systematic racial bias by police agencies around the country, the systematic racial biases of prosecutors have largely stayed under the radar. Can we better inform and educate the general public to understand the true depth of systematic racism within the judicial system? Can there be any meaningful progress to, um, as so long as the discussion is largely, largely limited to police agencies, should we be holding local prosecutors accountable for being complicit in perpetuating racism in their charging decisions, sentencing recommendations, and failure to prosecute or hold accountable law enforcement officers that demonstrate racial prejudices? Now, I can't, I can't say that um, we have a lot of attorneys here in the background. When Mr. Crump leaves, we'll try to engage in more conversations, particularly with the Pinellas um, uh, Bar Association, the Criminal Bar Association. 
But Mr. Crump, to the extent you can answer a very compound question, um, to the extent you can, please do so. And Sarah will follow. And again, we want to thank you. We understand when you have to cut out, cut out you have to cut out. But we want to thank you. Thank you, Kim. And again, thank you to the Institute for Strategic uh, Policy and Solutions. It's very important that we uh, give the uh, policies and procedures as a roadmap to help us effectively advocate and articulate I think that when we talk about and if we lost him, then I am going to ask our panel to I'm going to ask our technical director to, if you will, contact Mr. Crump and mute him and let him know we're still having challenges. And Sarah and Vanessa, you um, jump in to speak on this. Thank you. And I'd like to introduce Vanessa. Vanessa, if you will kindly introduce yourself why I the technical. I'd appreciate it. <laughs> sure. Um, good Good morning, everybody. It may be afternoon now. Good morning, or good afternoon, everybody. I'm Vanessa Albaum. I am the president of this year's um, Pinellas Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. I think my computer just froze. Can no, everybody, not. can you still hear me? You're good. Okay, technology. Um, we are a voluntary bar association in Pinellas County, um, and our purpose is to educate um, those about knowledge of criminal justice and also to pr promote legal and judicial reform. Um, so that's just a little bit about what we do with the Pinellas Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers um, was, I'm not sure if there was a specific question. Yes, the, the, the question was primarily about how do we address issues within the judiciary system? And to compound all the questions, there are a lot of them that focuses on, you know, I don't know anything about the judiciary, how do I find out? We're holding all these police officers accountable, but what are we doing to hold prosecutors accountable? What are we doing with our public defenders? How are we ensuring that they are following the policies or we as a bar are following the policies and procedures that um, also better out bias, if you will, and that, and that we are holding true to our canons about how to properly handle these most sensitive claims. Um, so that would be the gist of it. There, it's, a, it's a longer question in our Q&A, but I wanted to sort of distill it to make sure that the bar and all of our panelists can um, please put your um, open up your camera so that they can see your lovely faces. And we're just going to have a conversation moving forward until the end on these most important issues. But Vanessa, since you started it off, please, um, if you can address those issues, that would be great. Sure. Um, I definitely think there's power in numbers. Uh, with the Pinellas Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers this year, we're 140 members strong. Um, we communicate often with the issues as they're happening, and especially with, with what's been going on in the world lately. Um, that's more important than ever. Uh, so it's great that we have that open dialogue. We know um, when issues are arising and we have members in our group that are not shy and they are bringing some of these issues to the forefront and we're thankful for that. Um, we also, you know, to make sure we're communicating with the public defender's office, with the state attorney, attorney's office, with the judiciary, that we do have a seat at the table at those very important meetings. Um, so I think by having conversations like this, bringing awareness, power, and numbers, all of those things are going to ultimately um, provide more information and hopefully uh, get us to where we need to be. We're, it's definitely a step in the right direction. So if you don't know, they've done an amazing job this year. So Vanessa and Tim Sullivan and David Moran. And so uh, they have been very wow. active. <laughs> um, None of them, uh, well. sorry. <laughs> They have been incredibly active. Um, if, you know, I know why the membership's up because they keep everybody on point. They can communicate freely uh, because they are a private bar association. They've held people accountable and they managed to provide uh, 7,500 masks to the CJC. So um, this is an incredibly powerful organization uh, and the leadership in it is really strong this year. I just want to kudos to 
uh, Vanessa and her team, they've done a really great job and it's much appreciated, right? So uh, as a private bar, I think that's part of the regulate component of it, right? So who's in charge of the regulation? So that would be the private bar, the public defenders and the judiciary, and they're really stepping up this year. So good job, guys. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> I'd also like to turn that question to um, both Danielle and Valeria and our Dean um, of Stetson University College of Law, if there are any, uh, anything they'd like to add about what we're doing to hold our judiciary accountable, what we're doing to support um, biases in this particular area, and, and, and what your thoughts are generally. And for those of you all don't, who don't know, um, we are privileged to have the Dean because we know that she is so busy. And so we'd like your thoughts first on um, some of the comments that were made, but more importantly about fettering out bias within our system as an educational leader in the community. Thank you. Um, this is such an important conversation and I appreciate that we have representation from multiple communities and multiple leg of law enforcement. Um, the short tenet of my and tenor of my comments is as follows, you know, this is a, a global issue and a longstanding issue. You know, um, 1619 is quite a long uh, time away and we know that um, foot bias um, has been inculcated against uh, Black folks um, for um, a long time globally. So um, what is important about this moment is this awareness that we all have to tackle this issue from all aspects of the institutions and that we've changed the language from individual um, harm to um, institutional accountability. So from our perspective, um, as, as the bar associations, I've you as you've indicated so uh, pointedly, uh, the important uh, first principle is that everybody is a human and a person. So um, we are starting the conversation with our students here with um, accountability, professional accountability, and that the, the flaw is treating someone as um, a, a human who is dignified and that um, anything below that is a violation of expectations. Um, so we are not begging for human dignity. We assume human dignity um, and then post it from there. The second is that we all have a part to play and that racism is structural, bias is structural. So it is manifested in, the, in law enforcement, but it's also in educational setting. It's also um, in social interactions, et cetera. So we have a number of programs that we're working with our various constituents and all the educators and staff in the building to um, really unveil this bias that you that, that you so correctly pointed out. Um, they range from um, conversation about what responsibility this institution, our institution has for all the members of this community to how we can be of service to our local communities. So as I have this opportunity last and I, I welcome questions, this is my opportunity to, stay, to say that Stetson College of Law is aware of its own duty to be present um, to correct injustice um, in all forms and that we are here at the service uh, to be educated, to learn how we can be of value. So call on us so that we can start that learning process or we will keep looking and meet you where, wherever we need to be. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, there, are, I'm going to remind the panelists that there are a lot of questions and although <laughs> I am um, uh, very well trained from Stetson. and I have never done criminal law. I'm just fascinated by it, um, about procedural and constitutional issues. So I can't answer all of these questions, but I know our esteemed panelists can. So again, if we can't get to all the questions, our tech team will collate them and we will do our best to put sort of like a question and answer afterwards on our website when we put the links. I would like to take this opportunity to um, uh, thank Danielle and I will give you all of the proper names at the end. This, this has been quite interesting from a technological perspective as we are all um, doing all of this from our homes <laughs> and, and trying to keep up with the technology and all the changes. But uh, I was inspired. Um, I went to Stetson University College of Law and at, at the time the Fred G. Minnis Bar Association was dynamically led by, a, I would call a small cohort of us. And we got tired. 
and we didn't uh, we did our best to keep it up uh, along with uh, judge encouragement, but we got tired. This these new these new young lawyers t- took it to a whole new level. I'm so proud of them, um, including uh, y- you know a lot of the names that were mentioned today. But um, Danielle is the new president, and when she came to ask, "What can we do as a community to not get complacent?" Um, that is what inspired this conversation well before all the issues happening in the country. Um, I'm, I, 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 I admire um, her inspiration to say, um, you guys can't be tired yet. We all have an obligation. And when I asked her to make the call to help me collate all of these sponsors you see, um, she did her part and then some. So Danielle, thank you and congratulations on being the new president. And if you can answer some of the questions to the extent you can um, about what um, the the minority bar associations are doing. And I don't know if Chris is on, um, Cheris Campbell is on here as well. I hope I said your name right, right? There's so many names, guys. Um, If you all can answer your perspective on the prejudices, there are a lot of questions related to police officers. For example, how powerful is the fraternal order of police and how do we change such a powerful forum like that? or how do we, what happens to children when these issues happen? Um, if you all go through the Q&A, there's many questions related to police and equity about police brutality and mental awareness. So Danielle, I'm gonna let you take it on for a minute, followed by Valeria, who is the president of the George Edgecombe Bar Association. And um, we're, we're gonna keep this conversation going. Danielle. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, my name is Danielle Weaver Rogers and I'm the president of the Fred G. Menace Senior Bar Association. Um, Menace is named after the first African-American attorney in Pinellas County. Um, Mr. Menace was an advocate for equal justice, so we're excited to continue his legacy. So to address the uh, question about what are we doing as a minority bar association to address bias, I think one of the things that uh, we are doing in uh, the Menace Bar Association is partnering. Uh, We recently partnered um, and will continue a hopefully a long time uh, partnership with the ACLU legal panel. Uh, They came to us to ask us, you know, if there's attorneys that will volunteer to represent uh, peaceful protesters. So uh, one thing we're doing as a bar association to address bias is to continue these partnerships with organizations that are doing the work in the community and doing our part. And um, I don't know, Valeria, do you have, um, can, can you hear us? Thank you. How are you? I'm here. Sorry, my virtual screen isn't working. Uh, but hello, everybody. My name is Valeria Obi, and I've had the privilege of serving as president for the George Edgecombe Bar Association the last two years. I actually only have one week left, um, so my time is coming to an end. Um, But one of the themes during my presidency was preserving our power and essentially what that entails is um, attorneys understanding the important role that they play when it comes to certain social justice issues. So um, I made it my mission to provide programming to our members that kind of tackle different issues um, that we as minorities face. So earlier this year, we had the secretary um, from the Juvenile Department of Justice, um, Simone Marsteller, come and speak to our members about juvenile uh, juvenile delinquency in the state of Florida um, to address biases. Um, we uh, recently held a um, judicial forum for the candidates running for office. And one of the questions that we did ask them was about bias. Um, previous years, we've had um, a plethora of CLEs that also address um, bias because we have such a strong relationship with our judiciary. Um, so we love to pick their brains about that. Uh, we did have one planned um, for this year to uh, specifically talk about bias relating to um, the judiciary. However, um, that was canceled due to COVID. Um, and so we've also been approached about potentially hosting a um, community forum um, with law enforcement in Hillsborough County um, to kind of tackle these issues and figure out what can be done and what steps need to be taken to implement and change policies and to work on how we can essentially hold them to those standards. Um, But like I said, my presidency is up in um, the next week. So hopefully that um, the next president can continue on with that. Um, But we've done so many things to try to stay um, up to date and inform our members of what's going on and how we can be evolved. Similar to Menace, um, I'm sorry I didn't say this early, we are the Black Bar Association in um, Hillsborough County and we're named after the uh, first black judge in Hillsborough County, George E. Edgecombe. Um, So um, 
it's, um, it's been a pleasure serving as president. We're so excited that Danielle um, gave us this opportunity to participate in this event. Um, and we are always open for suggestions on different things that um, you guys think that we should be doing. So thank you. Ms. Campbell, thank you. I see that I can see your lovely face now. Um, Ms. Campbell represents the Pinellas Latin Bar Association. And if you could chime in on um, just explaining your membership and what you're doing to combat any issues that we've been talking about before we get back to the questions, I'd appreciate it. Yes, thank you. So I am Kyrus Campbell. I am the president elect of the Pinellas Latin Bar Association as well as a past president of the French Human Senior Bar Association. But the, the Latin Bar was recently formed in Pinellas County um, last year, actually, because we saw that there was a need for um, Latin attorneys to come together and deal with issues that face the Latin community as well as the minority community. And I had the, um, we had the privilege of teaming up with Minis last year um, to put on programming to promote minority lawyers to run for judiciary. Um, and this is still a current issue that we have. Um, a lot of the minority judges are retiring. And so we, we need to push for, I believe, you know, more Af African-American, um, Latin minority judges that represent the community that um, they serve. But, um, and also like uh, Ms. Jackson stated, a couple years ago, Menace really um, pioneered as uh, you know, being community lawyers. And we did actually put on a program a couple of years ago on the issues that were, were happening in St. Pete with the young, um, specifically after the young uh, African-American girls were killed after being pursued by, by the police. And as a result of that community forum that we held in St. Pete, we were able to secure funding from Senator Rusan um, to put on an aftercare program for these kids. And these were, this program was um, designed for the kids that were determined lost causes or habitual offenders. So, um, you know, we, we will continue to do what we can. Um, we work very closely with GBA, um, with Minis, and now that the Latin Bar has formed, you know, if we get any feedback or any kind of suggested, um, you know, community lawyering that we should be doing, please let, let us know. Thank you. And we'll also make sure that we have the contact information for all the bar associations um, before we, uh, when we post everything. Um, I wanted to, this is a very specific question as I'm going through the questions answered, they're so meaningful and it just seems like we have so much to do. This question though is specific to sensitivity training, which um, I don't know if any of the panelists can answer. But it says, as a black gay man living in St. Petersburg, Florida, to your knowledge, as it pertains to local law enforcement, what sort of any sensitive training have they had regarding minorities um, with the LGBTQIA community? And it looks like one of our um, panelists is going to answer that. Um, Catherine, I know that you, oh, <laughs> she's like, no, I'm not going to answer it. Is there anyone that can answer this particular question? Um, or do we have any information? Sure, I think that we should recognize that it is Gay Pride LBGQT uh, Pride Month. And so, um, you know, on Facebook, it came up that last year we were at a parade. So um, I think it's important to support each other, right? So we all need to be unified in it. And so I can tell you in the mental health frame, there is CIT training. And so that was one of the things, and I know it's a National Association of Mental Illness, NAMI, uh, was very effective in legislating. And I think that it's a good idea, right? And so Stetson is a really good partner probably for this because we've even been talking internally about what we can do for the public defender's office. And we're really fortunate to be surrounded by communities of education, right? That's critical. Education is key to this whole thing. And we have Stetson, we have uh, St. Pete College, we have USF. So we have some really great institutions uh, and I think that's where we go for the help, right? So how do you formulate that training? And so maybe that's one of the asks, right? I think that's important uh, because what uh, even Sh Sheriff has acknowledged is that, look, uh, we are not well equipped to handle mentally ill people, right? And so they started doing things like taking caseworkers. And so I think that is part of the training that needs to happen, right? For all of us, not just necessarily police officers, but internally within our own organizations too. 
Um, I, I also wanted to acknowledge uh, Teresa Conte of the Clearwater Bar Association, who has been instrumental in helping many attorneys um, with the community. And of course, the St. Petersburg Bar Association is also a sponsor. Um, I wanted to talk about one of the questions that talked about consistency um, with policies. And the question is something I don't know if we can answer, but we have over 18,000 police um, agencies, entities, as we now have learned and heard over and over on the news. Do you all have any thoughts on how to create consistent policies, or do you think it's sufficient and significant that we should have that level, that many consistent policies across the board in terms of police agencies? Sarah, can you tackle that? I can't, yeah. So I feel like that, you know, of course there are some basic things that need to be uniform throughout all policing agencies, right? So there's just some basic, like CIT training is one of the things. It's not negotiable, right? There's just some things that have to happen. Um, and talking about, you know, the policing 21 and the eight, a lot of those things have come up. So there's some basic premises, I think, that yes, absolutely have to be across the board. And so I kind of do think that it wouldn't hurt to have conversations about, so when you have that many different agencies, right, so even in our own experience at the CJC, when you have different judges, right, on different pages, it creates some, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen and you get a bad soup, right? So how do you do that? And how do you do that effectively? But then you also have to balance that, of course, against the rights of individual uh, entities to have their own policing agency and to have their funds spent the way they want them to be spent, right? So I think it's a balancing question. I think it's a good conversation to have. I will tell you that it makes me a little crazy to have to have a shared directory and try to figure out how I'm going to have all of those SOPs up to date, right? How do I know who all of those officers are? Have we done background checks on all of those officers? How many sustained complaints have they had, right? So we do that on regular witnesses and I think that we have to do it and we do, right? So like we have some fabulous attorneys. So like Justin Emanuel at our office, she could tell you the history about any police officer on the force, right? Any force. And so, that knowledge has to be available outside of just the public defender's office. And so how do you, you know, make that happen? You know, that's, that's what the strategic policy is about, right? So um, before we um, go to the end, I want to make sure I take time to thank you all, but I want to talk a little bit about policy and where do we go from here? From a solution oriented perspective, people have asked, you know, what is your role and what are you all trying to do? What we're trying to do is exactly what Sarah mentioned early is we are fortunate to have the congressional leaders in our state live very close to our county or in our county at this time. And we like to have continued conversations where we say this is what's happening in Pinellas County and this is how best to address it. For the attorneys on this line and of course for the community as well, you all are best poised to say what you think would be meaningful change in our community. We can't realistically make things happen without, of course, providing data and um, writing scenarios that con congressional leaders have to arm themselves as they're, as they're making these most important um, issues. But some of the work has been done for us. For example, both at our highest level, um, the Senate and the House have presented uh, judicial reform, right? And what they think is best practices. The 21st century police um, reporting that was done um, by the former president has substantial resources indicating challenges within the police system. Um, within the community, you now see uh, different um, municipalities that are specifically addressing resourcing um, funding for how we address issues in the community. And then from an attorney perspective, I truly believe only the attorney attorneys in the courtroom who are handling these particular issues have the best lens to say what we need to do. So what we do from here is have a further conversation where we write specific recommendations in what's called a white paper, white pages, so that we can present it and the congressmen will do what they will with it after it. But that's the solution oriented practice for the question that was asked about the importance of policy. That's the importance of policy. So I thank you all for being the think leaders. And also I would say it's important to have Stetson on this call um, and many young lawyers or young would-be lawyers because, um, you know, after you've practiced for so long, you get a rhythm of the system 
And, um, and I, I hate to say that, but you do, you get a rhythm of the system. And it's important as new lawyers to come along to challenge um, what's been presented and to ask why it's done this way and to ask if things can be done differently within the confines of our rules, regulations, and laws. So that's really important too. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, the panelists, I just wanna again say thank you um, for all of your work and all of my emails regarding this. I wanted to take a particular time to go through my list and if I missed it, um, I, I'm gonna start with people I haven't mentioned. Um, Vincent Massaro from Barney Masterson's Ends of Court was instrumental in helping me reach a broader population. I'm a former member a long time ago, and I appreciated his lens and also um, encouraging us to apply for bar credit, which we'll see if we receive. Again, Teresa Conte was um, very instrumental, as was Melissa Byers, in, in broadening this conversation to reach a larger legal community. Sarah didn't know what she was getting into, and I don't know if Catherine, her team, and now Howard, her team members knew how much work or questions they're likely going to get after this Zoom. <laughs> but I, I thank them for the work in advance that they're doing because it's important work. And these are the questions that, are like, uh, uh, that we're going to have to challenge in our community. Um, of thank course, you, um, <laughs> and, of, and of course, um, uh, and I don't want to say your wrong, name wrong again, Cheris. I've been struggling with that all morning as I was practicing, but um, both Cheris and Valeria and Danielle, you represent very strong communities that don't always get their voice heard. And so I think that you all are doing an incredible job of um, forcing the conversation to be more um, intergenerational, more intercultural. And that's an important part is how we grow as a community. And I hope I haven't left any of our panelists off um, of this phone call. Um, I just want to say thank you. Is Jonathan Massey available? I don't know if Jonathan Massey has a, um, a link, but Jonathan Massey from our Collaborative Labs was supposed to be on this um, forum to help share. And if he is, um, could you uh, put a question out? And Kyle, perhaps you can. If I could just say some final words. You know, we're all going through a lot of really difficult things right now uh, between, you know, it's a great time to be an elected public defender. There's a pandemic and protest and now we're in hurricane season and so I just want everyone to take care of themselves in their own mental health and think about the mental health of your clients too. I'm going to give a number and if I knew how to put it in the chat I would. It's a really important number. Uh, the NAMI NAMI website is a great resource uh, and so within the African-American community, there's the Wealth for Life, which is run by LaDonna Butler. She's fabulous. There's Dr. Brittany Peters. Uh, the number is 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-TALK. It's a suicide prevention hotline, and so I just think everybody should have that in their phone at all times. It's important. Uh, to take care of your mental health during this time. You know, uh, we're one people and we all stand for liberty and justice for all. I think most of the people on the call really want that. Uh, so take care of yourselves and take care of everyone else. Just be kind to one another, right? So 1-800-273-8255. Just take a second and put it in your cell phone. You never know when someone's gonna reach out and it's a critical number to have. And if anybody reaches out and just doesn't know where to go, again, we're gonna give all props to NAMI, N-A-M-I. It's a great organization and um, you can find help there. So before we wrap up, Vanessa, I see you. <laughs> I went through the list and like, who did I miss? I missed Vanessa and Vanessa. Um, again, you're, um, uh, the, the, the attorneys you represent are crucial to this conversation. So thank you for quickly um, responding. So I have a guest surprise. So John, Jonathan works with our collaborative labs. You should see him on the screen, Kyle, if you will showcase him right now. Um, Jonathan has been capturing the conversation. He's one of our artists with collaborative labs and he graciously agreed at the last minute, because I tend to do that to people, to, um, to join the conversation and to explain his artwork that um, memorializes our conversation that we plan to use um, as the cover as we move forward to presenting these white papers to um, our congressional leaders. Jonathan, if you will speak. And again, thank you, sir, for your time and talent. Okay, you're quite welcome. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna share the screen here. Um,
guess me getting close to the camera doesn't help. Oh, let's see. I don't think I, I'm not sure if I have the, oh, here we go. We can see the artwork behind you too, though. Oh, you got the, okay, wonderful. Um, okay, so basically, you know, we, we, we listened to all the speakers uh, and we wanted to visually interpret what was being said, what was being heard on our, on our end. And basically the, the idea of justice for all is the sort of the theme of this drawing. Uh, reforming the criminal justice system. Uh, so you have Lady Liberty there, you know, blind justice. Um, and it's going to take all of us working together to sort of uh, reform this uh, system. So here you have a group of people that are sort of standing on uh, the different challenges that we've heard in the last few weeks, you know, police brutality, injustice, uh, racism, and, you know, by working together to, to transform and uh, sort of to recreate these, uh, these justice systems and the policing system we've talked about, uh, we're, we're, we're going to be able to do it and make some changes here. So that's the gist of the artwork. Uh, and later on, we're going to add some color and just, uh, just highlight some of these, these things in, uh, in the drawing even more. So that's, uh, that's what we have so far. Amazing. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much. Yes. Can we please have a copy of that for the office? <laughs> <laughs> you have to stand in line, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> so for um, our last four minutes, um, I want to take the time to um, really thank our president who's giving me the leeway to um, move the Institute um, in a way that has balance with programming. I want to take the time to thank our, my provost, Mark Strickland, who um, is, is a really great balance for me because um, for most of you all who do know me online, I'm real A-type and, and he keeps me balanced and allows me this freedom to do these programs. I want to thank him for that. And I would like to thank our team, which is small and mighty behind the scenes. Um, this is our technical person, um, um, Kyle Bell and um, our administrative assistant, Sharon Panoff are on this call. And I just want to say that the importance of this work is this, this is just the beginning. Um, I have strong faith in the Pinellas County um, area, in the Pasco area. I have strong faith that we can work together on issues. And I have strong faith that when we have conversations off screen, um, that we can hold ourselves accountable. Um, it was the first question I had, uh, again, going back to why this conversation started, um, thinking about Danielle and young lawyers in general, but also um, one of my daughters asked, well, what, what are the attorneys doing? Like, we're always talking about the police officers. Are we holding the attorneys accountable? And it was a good question. So we have to continue to ask ourselves, are we holding each other accountable in this space as we go through the system and, and not just um, become rote um, attorneys, but that we continue to revive our passion. So with that, I wanna thank you. The Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions will continue this conversation. Um, please give us a week to get all this information up and out. And then we will share it with all of our sponsors and partners so that they can equally utilize it um, uh, the way they see fit. And we want to thank you for the continued conversation. I appreciate your time and have a great day.